the end of this, this presentation. So I wanted to introduce myself and uh, my collaborator here. I'm Lynn McCore, and I am the consultant for school psychology with the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. And I'm very pleased to have collaborated with Dr. Caroline Hextall, a licensed psychologist and owner of the Center for Mindful Development in Hillsboro, North Carolina. Um, Caroline has uh, graciously collaborated in helping to develop the content for this webinar. And I'm going to turn it over to her and welcome welcome her here today. All right. Thank you, Lynn. Um, I'm really excited to, to be here and to share a lot of information with you all about mindfulness and how you can incorporate it in the school setting. Um, just to give a little background of my experience and sort of how I got into mindfulness, um, when I was in my fellowship year at UNC, I did an experience where I did uh, dialectical behavior therapy, or DBT with a group of women um, who were experiencing pretty significant emotion regulation difficulties. And DBT um, is sort of a, a very well-respected intervention um, that at the core of it, or, or one of the real core components of it, is something called wise mind, um, which has its basis in mindfulness. And so that's sort of where I initially got introduced to the concept and to the whole world of mindfulness. Um, and that sort of sparked an interest to look into it more. And so then a few years after that experience, I took what's called the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, or MBSR, course at UNC. And that sort of started me on this path of practicing mindfulness personally and then pursuing it professionally as well. Um, in my practice, I, I use it when appropriate with, with clients and with families, um, and I have taught a couple courses on mindful parenting through UNC, um, the program on integrative medicine, which I've really thoroughly enjoyed. Um, so that's sort of my background in, in mindfulness and, and how I got to um, be really interested in it and, and how I've really pursued it since then. Great. So, in, and, and we're really happy to have you here today, Caroline, and uh, in the interest of full disclosure, um, we have our, you know, disclosure that Dr. Hexal, obviously, a comp as you just heard, a component of her private practice is mindfulness education, and this presentation is in no way marketing her private practice, but offering resources and tools to educators across our uh, North Carolina public schools. So in addition to the goals that Lynn mentioned at the start of the webinar, I'd like to frame some of the intentions, I think, for this, uh, for this webinar um, so that the viewers really come away with kind of really understanding what mindfulness is. So the intent of um, this webinar is for you all to really understand and, and feel a sense of what mindfulness is. And then also, so what? You know, so what does that mean? Why, why pursue it? Why engage in a practice of it? Um, and why teach it? And then also, why not? Um, in other words, what are some of the cautions or what are some of the barriers to be considering when implementing or when thinking about implementing a mindfulness program, especially in a school setting? Um, often, you know, it, it has gotten so much press in, in a positive way and sort of the, the antidote to stress and, and the, the end all be all. But, but there are some real cautions to be aware of, especially in implementing it in a school setting. Um, and then also sort of to help you all orient yourself to a planning stage, um, if that's something that you choose, you know, what next in mindfulness in, in terms of the implementation of a program, if, if that's what you have decided to do. Um, whether you're a teacher or an administrator, you know, what, what's next in, in terms of implementing mindfulness? Okay. All right. So in order to get sort of the experience of mindfulness, what I'd like you to do is place your fingertips to your fingertips. In other words, take one hand um, and place it to the next hand where all your fingertips are matching up. And find a space on the wall, sort of a blank space, or somewhere on the floor or you may just want to close your eyes. And when I say start, I want you to count the number of thoughts you have until I say stop. 
So start. All right, and stop. And you might just want to note, you know, somewhere, even if you just note it in your head um, as another thought, what you noticed about that experience. What, what came up for you? What feelings about that experience you had or, or any other thoughts? Lynn? Yeah, so I had about 13 uh -huh. thoughts go through my head. <laughs> That was in about 20 seconds. Um, so it's really interesting how in tune I was to focusing on exactly what I was thinking about at yeah. that time yeah. and making note of it. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. And it's, did you fall into the content of the thoughts or was it just noticing, oh, this here comes another thought, here comes another thought? It varied. Uh -huh. It depended, yeah. yeah, it was dependent upon, you know, I think how much in the forefront of my, you know, range of concern for the day. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, so we'll, we'll talk about that and how that influences sort of how aware you are of the thoughts. Okay, so now here's another exercise. I just want you to notice if you're breathing in or if you're breathing out. And there really is no right or wrong way to do this. Just notice if you are breathing in or if you're breathing out right now. And how about now? And now, so for most of you, and you can stop noticing, <laughs> um, for most of you, I've likely narrowed your attention to your breathing in, in just almost a split second by just telling you to notice this. In other words, a simple cue has really drawn your awareness to your breath as opposed to the hundreds of thoughts that may be generating through your mind right now. Um, back to the thought exercise, some of you may have had some thoughts of, gosh, this feels really boring, or what on earth are we doing here? This, doesn't, this isn't what I thought mindfulness was. I thought it was being calm and being relaxed and, and being in a state of being that, that is just you know, sort of this awe, yay, this feels really good. Um, but really, this is about noticing and being aware of what is occurring inside of you as well as outside of you. Um, and, you know, some of you may have also had this, the, those sort of judgmental thoughts of, am I doing this right? You know, this doesn't feel like what I associated mindfulness to be with. Um, so there is commonly a layer of judgment within our, our thoughts. Um, so you'll see in this particular slide that, you know, our, our minds are constantly producing thoughts. In fact, uh, some f folks have decided that and, and, you know, really studied this um, and learned that our mind can, can produce almost 60,000 thoughts a day, um, which is a lot. And most of the time we are completely unaware of what these, what these thoughts are. We just, it's sort of we're on automatic pilot. Our mind is just constantly producing these thoughts. They often have um, a component of what's going to happen in the future or what has happened in the past. So often we are not thinking about what it is that we are experiencing in the exact present moment, but instead, you know, maybe rehearsing a conversation we're going to have with a colleague in the future, whether that be in the next five minutes or in the next five years even. Um, or we are retrospectively thinking, oh, I should have said this or, wow, I shouldn't have done that. Um, so that's sort of this layer of judgment that, that often happens in our thoughts. Um, so, but what's important is to really recognize that this is just what our mind does. Um, similar to our digestive system and our stomach digesting, you know, our mind just produces thoughts. So mindfulness is really being aware of what is happening in the present moment. It is being aware of what is happening inside of us, so emotions that we may be feeling, 
and thoughts that may be occurring in our minds in the present moment. Again, so you know, we, we looked at some of those thoughts in the previous slide about what, what, what I need to do in the future and what I did do in the past, but mindfulness is really about being centered in, in what is occurring in the present moment and being very aware. The other aspect of mindfulness that is very important is that it is without judgment. So we can certainly be aware and we can be present um, and noticing what is happening around us. And a lot of uh, Ellen Langer's work on mindfulness is about this sort of top piece of this definition um, where it's more about noticing things and just noticing what is coming up. Um, but but this added layer of without judgment is another sort of theoretical piece to mindfulness um, that's important and, and a real core component of most of the curriculum uh, packages or, or curricula that are out there um, that are teaching mindfulness to children and adults is this idea that it's not only being aware and of what's happening in the present moment, but we are, it's without judgment. Mm -hmm. The other piece of mindfulness is that it really begins with you. It is sort of an inside job. So this is a difference between uh, social emotional learning and some of the other uh, like progressive muscle relaxation, although that has some some similarities with mindfulness as well, um, in terms of it being sort of what's happening inside of you and you being the, the source of change as opposed to something external changing you. And we'll get into sort of what how those are aligned and, and how they're similar and how they're different um, a little bit later in the presentation. So a lot of times when I bring up the term mindfulness or somebody reads the term mindfulness or they just hear it in the news or, or something of that nature. Um, they say, oh my goodness, I love mindfulness. And really I think, and, and people do, I mean, really <laughs> th this is something to really embrace. Um, but the reason why we sense this sort of affection towards it is that we really can tell the difference between our state of being when we are present and when we are aware and when we are noticing things versus when we are not, versus when we are mindless. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a real feeling sense that, that we get when we are being mindful and when we are aware and, and really noticing things. Mm -hmm. um, it's very different than the typical state of being that we're in. Mm -hmm. So I'll ask you, which would you prefer this is A, and this is, whoops, sorry, <laughs> and that's B. Okay, so we'll go back, A versus B. Now, a lot of you may, in looking at slide B, mm -hmm. may notice things that, that bring up positive feelings, you know, those crunchy sweet potato fries look good right now, especially as lunch is approaching or, um, you know, anticipating an email from a friend, maybe conjuring up some good feelings and good sensations. Um, I'm seeing some respondents chat saying A is definitely <laughs> their preference. <laughs> yes, they're that, especially after the kind of winter weather that we've been experiencing, at least in the, in the triangle region. Yeah. Um, so, but, you know, so there are a lot of aspects within this particular slide with Facebook and, and with the phone and things like that, um, that, that do bring up good memories or good thoughts or, or good feelings. Um, but often what happens is that when we are in A, mm -hmm. our mind is drifting mm -hmm. and we are pulled from sort of the salty air and the, mm -hmm. the sensation of the sand on our feet. We're pulled from being present in A by our email and by the Facebook likes or, or something of that nature, or you know, suddenly our, our Fitbit or some sort of device may buzz and we may think, oh gosh, where am I on my steps today or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so our attention is really pulled constantly by these, these and many other components that we see in, in Side B. Mm -hmm. So, and, and while, you know, even when you're like in an IEP meeting or a meeting with a colleague, a staff meeting, or maybe on a phone conversation um, that's important, 
while or or when you're teaching, you know, you may not be directly pulled by a notification or or looking at Facebook because obviously you're you're focused on on designing the IEP and really listening. But even the the mere idea that you know maybe earlier the week in the weekend you posted a photo of something and you're awaiting you know who has liked my photo so it you know those those notions and those ideas of of things that are influencing facebook or influencing our, our attention and pulling our attention still interfere with the meeting that is happening. So, so even if we're not directly on Facebook or directly on Pinterest, you know, our attention is being pulled in so many different directions mm -hmm. that, that we are rarely fully mm -hmm. in the meeting or fully at the beach. That is so true. And mm -hmm. I just, something that comes to my mind, like going toggling between mm -hmm. these two is just definitely a little overwhelming when I look at that screen mm -hmm. and we hope that you like the old school phones and, right um, but I definitely can see how I can situate myself to be a little more present when I'm looking at a mm -hmm. but some prefer B. yeah we saw we, we had some chat boxes some, that uh, indicated B was their preference uh-huh <laughs> and that makes sense because there are there are a lot of positive associations with, mm -hmm. with each of those photographs mm -hmm. um, and in a lot of in you know in such a world with with so much digital input these days you know we we do find that we are accustomed to kind of multitasking and and we feel like we're getting more more done and and we're productive when when you're balancing a lot of these different um, inputs and things of that nature so the idea is that, you know, if you're physically here in the classroom, say teaching or observing or doing a walkthrough or something of that nature, you know, <clears throat> when we are able to be mindful, we can be all in here. And when we are able to incorporate sort of a more of a mindful awareness, we can notice more things about the student that mm, maybe this is a an issue of fluency that we need to address as opposed to a decoding issue and then, then that's just sort of a reference to early readers mm -hmm. but you know it could be um, something about as we're doing an observation we notice that wow i see that this seating arrangement of having these two students next to each other really is not enhancing their performance. That's what may be driving some of this um, inappropriate behavior or something like that. Um, you know, or it could be that the as an administrator, you're walking down the hall and you recognize that mm, that student doesn't look um, as as cheerful as as she normally is or as talkative as he normally is and I wonder if there's something going on um, then that can prompt a referral maybe to the guidance counselor that, or to the school psychologist but it's it's this contrast and in, in this um, sort of conundrum that we're in when when our attention is here when we are physically here that we are pulled and, and we are not able to be physically and mentally and emotionally fully here in the classroom or in the school setting, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. whatever that setting may be for you. And that was one of the one of the chatters um, chimed in, and we're, I'm just trying to pay pay attention to both the chat box just in case there's any issues. But um, seeing that you know there was a comment that you know, and our minds are also like in school mode while they're attending to the webinar, right? Yes. So I wonder absolutely. if we can kind of try and incorporate some full, you know, like how difficult is that for people yes. to actually really focus in in the context of your work day right now, yeah. knowing on a Monday morning all of the things that are probably going on in the schools right. um, that, you know, they're fully tuned in to hear yes. um, as opposed to all the other stuff that's right. going on. And that is an, I'm so glad you all out there really noticed that because that is a perfect example of being mindful <laughs> because it's, it's this recognition when our mind is being pulled away. 
and recognition that, oh, I'm not thinking about the webinar. I'm thinking about that email that I can see behind the, the mm -hmm. you know, screen of the webinar mm -hmm. um, that may have just popped up. I wonder who, who emailed me. Is this an emergency that I have to attend to? And it's, it's that recognition that, oh, wait, my mind is drifting, and then to pull it back to the webinar that is an exact definition of being mindful. Mm -hmm. You're really aware mm -hmm. that something is shifting in your mind. Mm -hmm. So... Right. So maybe some of you might be experiencing a little bit of stress. Mm -hmm. um, this is something that we deal with all the time. Um, it is it is a state that you know we we have evolved mm -hmm. to experience a lot of stress, mm -hmm. and, and we continue to experience a lot of stress. Um, it's really a, a response from our body that says. Mm, something is occurring that's really knocking me out of balance, knocking me out of kind of homeostasis. Mm -hmm. uh, so physically, when we're out of this homeostatic balance, we usually feel it as maybe increased heart rate, headaches, or a stomach ache maybe, uh, increased muscle tension, chest pain, maybe difficulty sleeping where thoughts are interrupting our, our sleep in the middle of the night. And emotionally, we may be more irritable, easily frustrated or annoyed, helpless or even feeling hopeless at times, and really just overwhelmed. It's this kind of feeling of, of being overwhelmed. So this has subsequent effects socially in that we may then withdraw because interacting with somebody else seems too stressful. In other words, I just have to, you know, go to um, be by myself, for example. When... It, when that opposite response should be actually happening to decrease the stress. In other words, social support is, is one of the core factors of, of reducing stress for some people. And, and um, there are many people who prefer to sort of recover um, by themselves. Mm -hmm. um, the other aspect of stress is that it really causes significant wear and tear on our bodies in that we adapt to higher and higher levels of stress. Uh, over time. So we tolerate a state of being stressed so much that in reality, we're subjected to chronic stress more frequently than is really healthy. So, you know, muscle tension is one that that I'm sure many of you experience in terms of the tightness in your back and feeling like your shoulders are constantly tight or your neck feels, you know, you get sort of tension headaches. That is the effect of chronic stress. Physiologically, we re react to minor stressful events such as like a traffic jam or internet being slow or maybe you're baking a cake or, you know, baking cookies or something and they don't turn out the way that you had intended to. So we may react in such a way that that is over and above what, what the, the issue really calls for. So we have this same level of stress for these minor stressful events as we would for a significant health crisis or mm -hmm. for a, like a financial crisis or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so why am I talking about stress? You know, why, why did I shift from that beautiful beach picture <laughs> to talking about stress? Um, you know, mindfulness is, is really shown to be in many research studies, uh, sort of this, um, not, not antidote. I hate to use that word, but, but uh, something that is, really core to reducing stress and addressing the amount of stress that people are feeling. So right now I'd like you to just, so now I'm redirecting your attention with, with an activity so you can be aware of all the other windows that are open and be aware of the other things that are on your to-do list, but really bring your attention to identifying what your stressors are. And it could be in this very moment, perhaps it is stressful to be engaged and, and paying attention to a webinar when you know you have this whole list of other things to be doing. Or it could be that you have a doctor's appointment later in the week that is causing some stress. So just take a few moments to, to really reflect on what your current stressors are now. Okay, 
And now, what I'd like you to do is reflect on what your student stressors are. Or if, if you're an administrator, what are, your, what are the stressors of your staff members? Okay, so um, you may have, you know, jotted down family situations. Um, I'm, I'm particularly referring to student stressors right now. Um, family situations, homelessness even, grades, exams, standardized tests, college applications, etc. cetera. Um, so those are, those are stressors that we've really known about for, for many years and, and will probably continue to be stressors for students. Mm -hmm. um, but in the last, you know, five, ten years, the added layer of social media in terms of a stressor for students has really contributed pretty significantly to the amount of stress that students are experiencing. Uh -huh. um, so that's just another layer upon layer of, of other existing stressors that students feel. Um, but I think, you know, while it's not real core to this particular webinar to talk about the effects of social media. Um, it is something to be aware of and, and certainly something to be mindful of mm -hmm. when we think about what the stressors are that, that students are experiencing in terms of um, you know, whether or not the presence of a cell phone is, is um, affecting them in the middle of class. You know, certain mm -hmm. schools are, are going in different directions in terms of do we incorporate the cell phone in our class or do we do a strict ban of not having it? Um, this is more for middle and high school, but um, you know, even there have been some studies that show that even the mere presence of a cell phone in a room can increase people's stress mm -hmm. levels because they know that mm -hmm. something might be happening on that cell phone. Mm -hmm. um, so just something to really be aware of and, and reflect upon. Mm -hmm. So that brings us to this quote. Uh, it's between stimulus and response, there is a space and in that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. So it is in this space that Frankel is referring to that we ha really have this possibility to respond in a way that is thoughtful, less reactive, more effective, and perhaps kinder. And mindfulness is what opens that space. So again, sort of this is all the, the what of mindfulness. Um, you know, this is this is what being aware and being present allows us is that we we this pause and this space really opens up so that we can respond in a way that is more aligned with our values and more aligned with how we have what our intentions are when we're teaching or when we're working with others um, or when we're parenting for that matter. But okay. but really it, it opens up that that space. Yeah. So. The quest to kind of really learn more about this mindfulness, um, <laughs> because obviously it's it's shown some good um, good data, has resulted in in what you see here in this particular slide. This is a graph of of mindfulness journal publications by year from 1980 to 2016, and you can <laughs> see that very steep rise in the past you know 10 years or so, um, and it continues to grow. So. This particular resource is um, the American Mindfulness Research Association, which is included in your uh, list of resources, um, especially in the, the um, selected resource, uh, selected research uh, mm -hmm. studies. Mm -hmm. um, so, but but you can just see, you know, that that is why you know this increase in stress that we're feeling is is resulted in wow, we have potentially found something that really affects. Um, how we handle stress, and that's what has happened. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, as we were preparing for the webinar, we did allow for um, participants to submit questions, and I'm just pulling up on the screen 
some questions that were generally lumped into these similar categories around what are the evidence-based resources? Is there adequate data, like large enough sample sizes, to actually prove the success of mindfulness in the schools? Things like, I'm a huge advocate for this, so how do I find some um, evidence to kind of like bring to those that decision makers in my in my district at the local level to actually um, bring about some larger support for incorporating mindfulness in my classroom or in my school and just some just general like let's discuss how what what research do we have that shows how mindfulness interventions might correlate with increased academic performance so you know how would you Caroline, I, I see, you know, you pulled up and I, it appears as if you've kind of been monitoring this, you know, as it's become, because it is part of your practice. What, how would you respond to these questions? What information is available? Yeah. Well, first of all, these are great questions and, and it's really very pleasing to see that, that people are wondering about the evidence with mindfulness. I think that's very, very important and continues to be important. Um, so I'm just going to address some of these generally and then we'll get into some of the more specific studies. Um, so what are the evidence-based resources? You know, there are many um, sources for that have sort of combined a lot of these studies. Um, again, the American Mindfulness Research Association that just had that graph before, and then Mindful Schools, which I'll get into a little bit later, but they've been keeping pretty um, up-to-date data on, on a lot of this. Um, so there, you know, as it's grown, so has the research, and then the research continues to grow as well. Mm -hmm. um, adequate data in terms of large enough sample sizes, that also continues to grow. A lot of the early studies were, you know, very small, um, mm -hmm. you know, maybe a dozen, maybe a classroom size and things like that. But, um, you know, we're getting into the bigger sample sizes as, as the research continues to grow into, you know, full schools and, and full academic programs and things of that nature. So, yes, it is certainly growing. Um, a lot of the criticisms have been around the power of some of these studies, that they don't have sufficient power to really say, you know, is this um, something worth really getting into and, and really um, adopting within our school. Um, so just, uh, you know, certainly something to be considering, but, but yes, it is growing. Um, so data to prove its success, you know, there's there's always statistical significance, but to prove it is, you know, that's a higher order. <laughs> um, yeah. But we'll get into sort of the details about some of these studies. But, but you know, a lot of it's correlational data, um, but in, in the, the randomized control studies are becoming more and more prevalent, just recognizing that we need to have sort of more rigor in the, in the, in the science of it instead of just the correlational studies. So, um, mm -hmm. and then the last question of discussing the research that shows how mindfulness interventions might correlate with increased academic performance. Most of those studies um, really look at the executive functioning of, so mindfulness is really impacting the attention system of the brain and the and the executive functioning of the brain in that it, it increases self-regulation and things of that nature, which then increases academic performance. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're starting to in, increase looking at, okay, is there, it, you know, there's obviously just going to be a correlation because mm -hmm. the, the mindfulness itself is not going to boost test grades, but, mm -hmm. but it's going to allow for a more self, a more regulated state within a student and a more um, attentive state. So then that in turn, in theory, increases um, how well a student is able to perform academically. Mm -hmm. To the handout here. Sure. So um, if you go to the handout now, it's the it's titled Selected Research Studies in Mindfulness. Should be um, the second handout um, in your in your dashboard there. Um, should have uploaded. So you should have that as your second handout listed. Selected research and uh, studies in mindfulness. Okay. 
Um, so the first one we can look at, you know, mindfulness meditation may lessen anxiety, promote social skills, improve academic performance among adolescents with learning disabilities. Um, this was just a pilot study looking at feasibility. So a lot of the early studies also were looking at, um, you know, is this feasible? Is this okay. something that uh, school districts can adopt that, that adolescents or school-aged children can actually do? Mm -hmm. um, and most of the studies have shown, you know, over and over again that, yes, this is pretty feasible. This is um, does not require many resources, does not require... Um, well, it does not require a lot of financial mm -hmm. input in terms of, um, you know, needing to get a particular resource. Um, so, it, and we'll get into that a little bit more when I talk about the resources and the, the availability of, of certain curriculum um, programs. Um, but back to this particular study, they did deem that it was feasible, predominantly positive attitudes towards the program, and it did redu redu result rather in uh, decreased state and trait anxiety, better social skills, and improved academic performance. But again, that academic performance boost is usually related to better self-regulation and decreased anxiety, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, then the next one out of the Journal of Applied School Psychology, um, effects of mindful awareness practices on executive functions. So there's a study that looks directly at the executive functions. Here's a little bit of a larger, slightly larger sample size of second and third graders. Um, this particular mindfulness program was about half an hour, two times a week for eight weeks. Um, students who were less well regulated at pretest demonstrated more improvement in the executive functioning than those students who had more skills with self regulation at the beginning of the intervention. In other words, they showed a greater in increase in the self regulation because they had more. Um, a greater distance to go, really. Um, and then skipping down mm -hmm. to um, the mindfulness among home visitors, again, this was just a correlational study. This is Becker, Patterson, Fagan, and Whitaker um, out of the Journal of Child and Family Studies. This was, again, a correlational study looking at dispositional mindfulness of home visitors. And they found that those home visitors with greater dispositional mindfulness had greater alliance with family members. So when they were going into the homes and doing home visits, there was a greater alliance or a greater connection with the families mm -hmm. in those home visitors who had um, more of this trait or dispositional uh, mindfulness. Um, then the final one on this, on the first page of the Selected Research Studies handout, um, neural function before and after mindfulness-based cognitive therapy in anxious adolescents at risk for developing bipolar disorder. So this was a study looking at a small group of, of adolescents who were at risk for developing bipolar disorder, um, and they used a, a uh, mindfulness-based cognitive behavior therapy um, to see what changes neurologically they had, and they found that there was an increase in activation of the brain structures related to interoception, which is essentially the sense of uh, the internal state of the body and processing of internal stimuli. And to me, that reflects, again, sort of mindfulness is an inside job. You know, this is change from within. Um, this is really, which, which in theory has longer lasting impact. Um, so, so those are some, some kind of just interesting mm -hmm. uh, studies. On the back of that sheet, um, I've listed more of the broader uh, research sources that you can see. Um, in 2013, the, there was an entire issue of research and human development that was dedicated to mindfulness-based interventions in school-based settings. Um, there's a there's meta analyses that that continue to emerge, which are very important in this field. Um, the Greater Good um, Science Center has an entire uh, PDF document. It's many many pages long um, that highlights a lot of the research, and it continues mm -hmm. to be updated. Um, and then. The Go AMRO, which is the American Mindfulness Research Association, also has an ongoing database of research in the field of mindfulness. Um, and most of that is free, so, so you can access most of that without uh, needing to 
have access to a paid database or anything. Mm -hmm. um, then I also list the critical analysis. Um, these are these are documents that really are taking an important critical look at you know what are we doing with mindfulness in the schools and what are we doing with mindfulness in in general. Um, you know where's the proof that mindfulness meditation works? Mind the hype, etc. Uh, Willoughby Britton is is an important. Um, contributor to the more critical analysis of, of how mindfulness is being used and, and sort of promoted, um, recognizing that there are real reasons to be cautious about using mindfulness, and we'll get into that um, towards the end of the presentation. Mm -hmm. um, so those are those are important articles to read and just be aware of. You know, these are the other aspects of mindfulness that really need to be considered mm -hmm. um, in addition to the the positive things that are happening. Mm -hmm. so. Thanks, Caroline. Uh -huh. I'm going to toggle back over here. And I just want to say I see some great like comments and questions coming in. Unfortunately, we've got about 40 minutes left and we've got some more content to go to. So we're going to, um, we're not going to be able to respond to all the questions that come in. We might, ha if there's any time left at the end of the broadcast, be able to squeeze a few more clarifications in. However, um, this these will all be downloaded and there will be some sort of response issued to those that are submitting questions in chat and I love seeing some of the comments um, we are gonna we aren't gonna be able to address everything coming in or even some of what's coming in that I'm monitoring um, so that we can get through the content and hopefully some of these questions or clarifications will also be answered through the resources that are provided. Um, there wasn't any, was there anything else on this? No, that, that was just kind of, that slide kind of just captured what um, Caroline put together, you know, for just as a reference point, I think has a lot of really good resources linked right in it, as she said, that are not most of them not for any additional fee that you can access and keep up to date on what's going on with the research and it'll be interesting to see over the next couple of years how much that um, that graph grows even higher mm -hmm. <laughs> that you showed earlier um, around the existing research um, and what what types of studies are being done some additional questions that um, came up around this topic were if we want students to be able to attend, focus and regulate their emotions, why aren't we explicitly teaching mindfulness? And then what about um, whether or not we foresee these skills becoming part of the North Carolina State Standards? And here's some good news um, for everyone that the what I have um, in this slide is is the guidance essential, essential standards. It's a document that was put together and this is available actually um, on the school counseling wiki. Uh, I want to make sure that's exactly where it was accessible from. But this is just something that took the guidance essential standards and um, the developmental levels um, in this screenshot, basically took the essential standards around social emotional, career, and cognitive academic um, skills standards and it has the developmental levels kind of just all put together in one document um, as a as a reference for those that are teaching these standards um, so it is actually something that could be incorporated into mindfulness can actually embed, be embedded into many of these essential standards that you see listed along the left hand column of this oh sorry document I can't scroll down it um, because it's a screenshot, but I also wanted to mention um, in response to those questions, just so that all of the listeners are, are aware that these essential standards are there, as well as the um, healthful living essential standards also particularly um, you know, address or can mindfulness practice can be incorporated into um, the healthful living essential standards as well, particularly the mental and emotional health standards and the interpersonal interpersonal communication and relationship standards. So for those of you that are interested in learning more about what already exists as our state standards um, through which uh, mindfulness can be addressed, um, I'll direct you on over to the K-12 standards um, page of the of DPI's website, um, K-12 standards curriculum and instruction, and you can see that um, you can click on to the guidance um, tab here and it will bring you to the essential standards for guidance. Right below that is the healthful um, living. So those standards are there and um, 
they're intended really to be delivered by all staff. Um, they can be integrated into other curricular areas, um, so they could definitely be woven in where appropriate into other areas of the curriculum. And just certainly please um, refer to these standards and um, understand that there actually are places in our state standards now where mindfulness can be incorporated. So what about some myths All and right. misunderstanding? So these exist. <laughs> um, one of the first ones that I that I hear a lot is, oh, I, I just can't do mindfulness. I, I have too many thoughts. I've tried it before and, and I just can't stop thinking. So the myth and, and you know why that's misunderstood is that of course you have too many thoughts. We all have too many thoughts. If you didn't have thoughts, there would be concern. Um, so yes, <laughs> you are going to have multiple, you know, 60,000 almost a day thoughts that, that you'll be contending with. Um, but that doesn't mean that, that you creates stress in it me personally. Stress. Yes, just knowing just, that there's about 60,000 <laughs> thoughts that's produced even a just day. Hearing that number can certainly ramp up some anxiety. Um, mm -hmm. So, so Yes, I, I understand that perspective of, oh gosh, I feel overwhelmed. So then when you do feel overwhelmed and you do feel, I have so many thoughts coming into my mind right now, just be aware of that. Just notice, oh my gosh, this is overwhelming. I can't bring my attention back to my breathing or I can't bring my attention back to the sensations in my feet right now because I have so many thoughts. So you are experiencing the feeling of being overwhelmed with thoughts and then be mindful of that. Mm -hmm. So it's not that you're doing something wrong or that you can't do it. Um, you know, this is, this is just a state of being, there's no real task involved. This is just what, what are you aware of what's happening in the present moment? Um, another sort of myth and misunderstanding is, and this kind of goes along with what I just said, I've tried mindfulness before, I just can't stop thinking. You're right, you can't stop thinking. <laughs> um, and that's not the intent of mindfulness. The intent of mindfulness is to watch your thoughts, is to be aware of what it is that you're thinking and not fall into the content necessarily, just to watch them, just to be aware of, yes, I am thinking a lot. A lot of things are coming up for me right now. Mm -hmm. And then maybe bringing back to an anchor or a, or a breathing, um, you know, what breath you're on or something of that nature, mm -hmm. which reminds me, I really didn't get into that in terms of, um, you know, why often in mindfulness we use the breath to, to come back to in terms of, and it's often called an anchor, um, to sort of reorient yourself to what's happening in the present moment. The reason why the breath is often used is because it's always with us and we always are breathing. Mm -hmm. So we always can notice, oh, am I breathing in or am I breathing out? Or what is what are the sensations that I have as I'm breathing in? And where do I feel that deep breath coming in? You know, am I feeling it from my belly? Am I feeling it from my chest? And do I feel it, you know, rushing in the cool air rushing in, into my nostrils? Do I feel the warm air rushing out from my mouth? You know, those are aspects that are always with us um, of breathing. Just as we're always breathing, we're always thinking. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that's why in mindfulness practice, it's often used as, again, an anchor. But it doesn't have to be. It can be other, other there can be other anchors as well. Um, Okay, so then the next myth or misunder misunderstanding is, well, I'll do mindfulness when I'm calm. In other words, I can't be mindful when I'm angry. Mm -hmm. um, and this, this is perpetuated by a lot of the images that we see when we um, see advertisements about mindfulness, et cetera, where we only see pictures of mm -hmm. rocks stacked in a, in a beautiful mountain stream, where we only see you know, people in a meditative pose sitting by the beach. Um, really, mindfulness is, is awareness, and it's awareness of, of what is occurring in the present moment. And if you're angry, that's what you're aware of. If you're frazzled, that's what you're aware of. It's, it doesn't, you don't then shift into, oh wait, I should be calm mm -hmm. because that's not what you're, what, that's not what you are. That's not the state of being that you are in that moment. So mindfulness is if you're angry, be angry. And then, you know, really feel into what is it like to be angry? What is it like to be sad? What is it like to be worried right now? Um, 
I think that's a really important point when we're thinking about working with our students. Very much so. Mm -hmm. Yes, without a doubt, because especially for adolescents, mm -hmm. many adolescents will say, well, this is ridiculous. Okay, tell me, what does mm -hmm. that feel like for this to be ridiculous? Mm -hmm. What? It, what? It, you're annoyed. I get it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, of course, that is a very common response. Like, this is ridiculous. I don't want to do this. So, you know, what is what are you aware of? You're aware of this resistance. What is it like to be aware of resistance? Mm -hmm. There's always something to be mindful of. That's why there's nothing inherently um, difficult or there's nothing inherently, um, you know, uh, I, let's go difficult about mindfulness because it's simply a being aware of what is occurring in the present mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. So you know, you're not doing it wrong. There's no, you know, the instructions themselves are very simple, right? So it's being aware of what's occurring in the present moment without judgment. However, it's not easy. Mm -hmm. And so it's like parenting, right? <laughs> <laughs> There's exactly. early, even right. young children, right? Like infants, like the yes. tasks that come along with parenting are not complex, but they're not easy. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. The actual instructions are right. You know, if, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But, but it's, and it's a lot of times, um, difficult or we feel, we sense this, discomfort with it because it is tapping into something that often we're not comfortable with because we're, we're really an observer of our thoughts and a, an observer of our feelings. And that can get sensitive. That can get difficult for some people. And that, again, well, I think it might be coming up soon mm -hmm. um, about why this is, mm -hmm. you know, why there are inherent cautions to this. Mm -hmm. um, okay, then the other myth or misunderstanding is that everyone needs to do mindfulness. Well, not really. You know, this is, everyone can, and everyone, you know, we just are awareness. Um, so it's just being mindful. But but we this doesn't have to be pushed on people. And, and you know, I really um, feel that we need to be aware of, of if we're trying to push it on people because mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. it's then then it detracts from from the good that it can do mm -hmm. um, if we're really being kind of pushy with it. Um, the other myth is that I have to become Buddhist or I have to be Buddhist to be mindful. Certainly, you know this the the roots are are you know 2,500 years old and so you know this is something that has been occurring for thousands of years um, and and there has you know some core. Uh, origins into the and in, in Buddhism, but you do not have to be Buddhist. You, I mean, there there are many religions that have a contemplative component to them mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that it that are not at all associated with Buddhism. So um, you do not have to be a monk. You do not have to go sit on a mountaintop to be to be mindful. <laughs> So let's get into a little bit of the language. Um, you know, mindfulness versus meditation. A lot of folks say, well, how are those different? Um, well, mindfulness, again, is being aware and present non judgmentally. Some other definitions or other ways of understanding it. Ellen Langer, I think I mentioned her earlier. Um, she does a lot of research on, on mindfulness, especially uh, for older um, individuals in terms of. Uh, when they have dementia and how can we you know, help them in um, remembering things, and et cetera. She phrases it as the simple act of actively noticing things, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, being actively attentive to what is happening within you and around you. And then John Kabat-Zinn, who is the kind of originator, the founder of the MBSR, which again stands for the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction um, program is paying attention in a particular way. Um, so those are mindfulness kind of definitions. Then meditation is really intentionally resting the mind to be relaxed and inwardly focused. So some of you may have heard the the phrase transcendental meditation um, and uh, insight meditation. Those are all more inwardly focused and um, more of an approach that that often people get into after learning a little bit about mindfulness. Mm -hmm. um, but it's more of, you know, you're just intentionally resting the mind. So mindfulness meditation is more of the sitting meditation where for 20 minutes, five minutes, one minute even, you are sitting and you are remaining still and you are actively you know, each time you notice a thought coming up, you bring your, you notice it and you bring your awareness back to your breathing and then you notice it and you come back to your breathing. Um, 
But a sitting meditation is where that's just what you're doing. Mm -hmm. A walking meditation is where you are intentionally walking to notice what emerges for you as you're walking. And you intentionally focus on the placement of your feet on the ground and the sounds that you hear. Eating meditation, you're intentionally focusing on the flavors and the the smells and the textures of your food. Um, so it, it's more of a intention, intentional focus on, on what mm -hmm. is occurring in that exact moment and how you are interacting with that moment. Mm -hmm. um, I think mm -hmm. it's really important to illustrate the differences in these uh -huh. um, because as I'm thinking about some of the, you know, students that I've worked with and the mindfulness meditation piece seems like that comes across as the harder sell, the, mm -hmm. you know, this is nonsense, this is annoying, I don't want to do this, whereas like that just helping students to be more actively aware in the moment mm -hmm. of what is going on might be, you know, a little, I guess, an easier sell for lack yeah. of better terminology, but really right. understanding. I like the way that you've kind of teased out the differences between mm -hmm. some of these different yeah. ways to practice. I think right? it is. I, th I think especially because meditation often has connotations that are more associated with Buddhism and, and the Eastern religions and things. So I think schools often are feeling like, oh, we don't want to get into meditation or yoga even. I mean, but but there are so many programs that are very secular in, in yoga um, mm -hmm. that are being incorporated in schools even. Um, but it is good to be aware of sort of what your language is mm -hmm. and, and how you're using it. Mm -hmm. Do you really understand the difference? And are you how are you going to live out that difference mm -hmm. when you're practicing it and when you're teaching it, mm -hmm. if, if that's the route that, that you kind of choose to take? Okay. Thank you. All right. That. All right. So some of you may be thinking, gosh, this kind of sounds familiar to some of the other things that I've heard about. And you're <laughs> right. Um, you know, mindfulness has a component in, in a lot of different sort of approaches and, and um, ways that we want to help with social emotional learning, especially social emotional learning. Um, <laughs> so you're right. And, and there is an article in your resources. Let's see. It's um, I think resources at the beginning stages, I believe. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Where it is from um, I might have to take a minute to look. It is um, at the very bottom of that first page, an article, How Social Emotional Learning and Mindfulness Can Work Together. Um, just remember that mindfulness is really an inside job, right? It is changing from within. It is changing um, the inside, how we, how we reflect and how we are aware of what is occurring within us and then externally as well, but then how that impacts us within a, inside. And then social emotional learning, a lot of the components of social emotional learning are more, okay, how do we teach skills to mm -hmm. on the outside to then change the inside? So mindfulness begins inside and then to change the outside. Social emotional learning, character education, growth mindset, et cetera, are, okay, how do we you change the outside to, to then subsequently change the inside? And both work. Both are important. Both can work in concert together. Um, you know, it's it's not one or the other, and, uh -huh. and I don't think anyone in mindfulness intends for this to replace social emotional learning. Uh -huh. um, this is a, we're really wanting to to improve how students learn and and how stu and how children grow up and and how they interact with their world and how their world interacts with them. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. so they're not um, at odds with one another. Uh -huh. So, okay, so let's get in a little bit to the, the cautions with mindfulness. Yeah, we did have some questions around okay. that. So I think yes. that these, I think that the, what you've, um, what we've got here might address some of the questions that came in as kind of our anchors good, around good. the question. Yeah. Okay, okay, <laughs> super. Um, so the first caution is students with significant trauma histories. So the reason why this is um, an area of caution is that for many students and many adults who have experienced significant trauma in their life, when, when, it, when we engage in a mindfulness practice, when they are closing their eyes and when their breathing slows and they are paying attention to their breath, this can bring up, this can re-traumatize them. In other words, it can bring them back to this place of 
being still or being quiet when they had to for a traumatic reason or for a for a reason that was traumatic. Mm -hmm. um, so the the associations with mm -hmm. being still and keeping my eyes closed, you know, it those are that's traumatic for them. Um, so so that's the caution that. If you know that you have students who have significant trauma histories, and, and I, I take the term trauma, um, you know, I'm, I'm using this mostly with sort of big, treat, big T trauma, mm -hmm. um, but you just have to be cautious, cautious rather, um, about, you know, knowing your students and knowing who you're teaching and knowing um, whether that's an adult, whether that's a teacher, whether that's a student, um, you know, that, that what, what may this, what, what might engaging in a mindfulness practice bring up for them? Because really, you know, it begins, mindfulness is often introduced and, and a lot of people continue to follow the path and they recognize that, whoa, this is really getting deep. Like mm -hmm. this is, this is, um, I'm approaching memories and approaching ideas and thoughts and feelings that I haven't touched in a long time, or I haven't experienced in a long time. Um, and that can be difficult for many people. Um, and so some of the, the articles that, that are referenced in the, in the critical analysis and, and what you may hear in popular press as well, reference, you know, these, these experiences that individuals have had in retreats in, um, you know, five day, three day, 10 day retreats where it's a very intensive practice of mindfulness meditation, um, that they come away feeling, whoa, this is, I didn't like this, uh -huh. but, but, you know, it's it's becoming more and more recognized that we have to have a, a, a place for them to feel supported. And the teacher who's teaching those retreats needs to be aware of, OK, when do we back off a little bit? When do we go slower? When do we um, engage in this meditation in a, in a slightly different way? All of that to say, you know, for, for most of the people who are probably listening to this webinar, that's going way deeper than, mm -hmm. than what they're intending. Yeah, we, um, yeah. Yeah. So, so, but, but just to know that that's why having a personal practice as a teacher is so critical because really if you point. are not aware of, well, you know, how is this going to affect me and how is this going to affect my students, then it could, it could end in a way that that's, you don't want it to end and it doesn't have to end that way or it doesn't have to go down that path. Mm -hmm. So just to really be aware that, that if, if you have your own personal practice, then the chances of bumping into some of these um, cautions is less likely. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and as you keep up kind of with the research as well. Right. Great. Um, okay. And that leads us into self-practice is inconsistent or non-existent. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really, I feel pretty strongly about, about having a practice if you are teaching mindfulness um, because mindfulness is how you are it is not what you are doing um, it's your presence it is your awareness of what is occurring within your students as you are ringing a bell or um, having them pay attention to their breathing it is your approach and your again your presence in in those lessons that matters most um, it is really critical that that, that is there um, so you know yes we can all look at a, a deck of cards or or a, a website with some really great great resources and really great mindfulness um, based stress reduction skills and, and things of that nature and exercises that are fun to do and things like that but but if it's coming from a let's do this because this is going to lead to better test scores or better um, academic performance I think that's yes, probably that, that last one yes, that last is. cautionary so one. there's you know there's also this this drive often to wow this could really have you know fewer behavior referrals and things like that, which it can, but when you're you gotta go you gotta go through the process in order to you know experience the outcome. You it's it's often you know you don't want to be going into mindfulness with the expectation and with the under the guise of, of oh I'm gonna raise test scores or I'm gonna increase academic performance or we're gonna have you know better self regulation. It happens. Research shows that it happens, but but you've got to get there through the practice. You can't mm -hmm. get there through the sort of goal-oriented, uh, I'm going to 
I'm going to do this because. What I like to call that distorted intention. Yes, a distorted <laughs> intention. I yeah. think that's a fantastic <laughs> phrase for that. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Great. So. And I see that we are approaching our last 15 minutes here, okay. so we're going to get through the rest of this and make sure that everyone has um, an understanding of the resources that are attached to, of course, not being able to address everything. The Some more questions that came in, lots of the questions that came in were around application across a variety of settings and age groups, such as low-performing schools, high schools, pre-kindergarten, at-risk populations, specific disability subgroups, just lots and lots of questions around how do we apply this across a variety of settings. So just kind of a broad base, we, and rather than addressing every question individually, we put together some resources yeah. for, um, as part of this webinar to try to address, address that. Right, so, <clears throat> excuse me. You'll see um, the resources at the beginning stages. I've kind oh, of sorry. outlined mm -hmm. <coughs> excuse me, um, videos and books and a listserv that's particularly helpful, um, different websites and articles that are helpful. Mm -hmm. <coughs> excuse me. Um, so, you know, yes, the application is, is wide, um, and it can be applied at, at young, even preschoolers. Um, kindergartners through fifth graders, et cetera, <coughs> and in the middle and high school ranges as well. Um, so I'm going to just pull up some of those really quickly and just um, direct you all to some of the, the resources that were available. Um, as Caroline was referencing, she's uh, kindly put together kind of a an organized <coughs> Um, way to go about because there's a plethora of resources. So trying to put together a repository for the listeners here to be able to have um, strong resources to go to, to be able to reference and know that they're they're good, they're good resources. Um, because I'll, whenever we have something that is becomes very much increased in popularity and at, begins becoming sort of a buzzword, such as mindfulness, we want to make sure that we are actually accessing appropriate resources to help guide some of this work and thinking. So the beginning stages, one, it, um, lists videos, books, podcasts, all different types of um, kind of like thinking about in the early stages as well as um, a resource that was put together specific to the elementary years that you all should have access to everything that I've shown so far, um, uh, kindergarten through fifth grade and their teachers, and um, books, videos, adult books, websites, um, different types of curricula that are available. I know there was a question that came in around thoughts around the Mind Up curricula. Uh -huh. um, the curriculum, I'm sorry, and uh, you know, just just <coughs> knowing if they're listed here, that they're not, they're they're good. You know, they're good resources. The one that you we were not able to upload into the uh, handouts because we had a limit of five <laughs> uploads. It will be with the archive. Um, is the resources for adolescents in middle and high school and their teachers. So um, that will. That's something that will be um, uploaded when we archive as the sixth handout. And you can see that there it goes along the same lines of books, um, different types of uh, websites that you can access for good information and programs, as well as the curricula that's listed there are definitely um, appropriate to review and consider as you move forward into um, what, whatever stage you're in in planning or implementation, um, that's kind of where we went with the amount of questions that came in around these types of items, like the types of training available, mm -hmm. types of resources available, and what suggestions might be um, for educators in their continued professional learning and development to be able to um, incorporate it into themselves so that they could better um, implement it within, you know, a broad range of uh, different students that you're working with. Um, I didn't know if there was anything else you wanted to say about the the questions that came in around resources and application. I don't Caroline. think so. I think um, just recognizing that, you know, <coughs> excuse me, um, that in general, as you're starting this, you know, having some sort of 
face-to-face -face practice with somebody is really beneficial. Um, certainly some of this information can be shared and learned online, and there are some really good programs online. Um, but if you're really just beginning, you know, it can be really helpful to have somebody sit with you and, and just, you know, practice this together. Um, I think you get a little bit more of a sense of what mindfulness is when you're learning it from a teacher in, in front of you, mm -hmm. um, face to face. But it doesn't have to continue that way throughout the, the learning. Mm -hmm. um, but just, just something to consider. Mm -hmm. um. <coughs> I know. So I, I'm going to jump in and just say, you know, I, I do have this cold and I apologize for all my coughing and stuff. Um, it is just something to be mindful of and, and recognize that, 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 that this is my state right now. Right. So. And that we were, we were, it wasn't bad enough where we were going to cancel the broadcast. Exactly. exactly. Indeed. Uh, and I appreciate that you, you are here with me today. Um, and, and we are getting, you know, towards the last 10 minutes, and I know that's worn on your voice um, over the past hour, but just going over, kind of bringing it all home and um, coming, bringing some big ideas together and thinking about planning, like what next steps might be. Yeah, I think, um, you know, what I really, when I reviewed sort of the intents um, or the intentions of, of this particular webinar, you know, I, I would like for people to really come away with a good sense of what mindfulness is. Um, and just recognizing that mindfulness is really about awareness and noticing um, and being observant of, of what it is that is around you and, and also within you. Mm -hmm. And then also that layer of being non-judgmental. Um, and then also just knowing you can do this. This is mm -hmm. not, you know, something that even if you're flooded with thoughts constantly, um, it doesn't mean, excuse me, that that you, you know, cannot do this. This is, again, it's, it's just, is being aware and you can always be aware of feeling like you can't do this. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, and to really just be mindful, honestly, to at every stage of adoption and, and, um, and implementation of any kind of mindfulness program in the school setting and be mindful of your own practice um, mm -hmm. during, you know, when you're learning. Um, if you're teaching mindfulness, practice mindfulness. You know, it's about being mindful, not just doing the mindfulness mm -hmm. practices or the exercises or the, the skills that you may be learning about. It's far more important. I would rather see, um, you know, a group of teachers or a classroom teacher really learn about mindfulness and, and engage in their own practice and see what changes